All right, so we're going to continue with our, our lessons. Um, there's a transition. You'll notice the way the lessons were broken up. They were designed um, to take you on a journey for the first test. It was designed to introduce you to the backdrop of psychology and the antecedents of psychology. Uh, then for test two, which you just finished, that's designed to show you the early developments of psychology. Uh, so from this point forward, we're gonna um, show you some of the uh, practical applications of psychology. And uh, we've moved beyond Wundt and Titchener and um, the early philosophers around psychology. And now we're actually talking about schools of thought that remain with us even to this day. All right, so the purpose of this lesson is really to talk about how psychology went from a philosophical discipline to an applied discipline and uh, how we got many of the subspecialties of psychology we have uh, today. So as you may recall, uh, Everything is about evolution, right? Everything must evolve or it dies out. Well, the same uh, concept can be said about psychology. And uh, you learned about Darwin in an earlier lesson, but that whole evolutionary doctrine of Darwin and that functional psychology of William James started to really take hold in the United States. Uh, and by um, the end of the 1800s and the beginning of the 1900s, there's a shift in psychology. So uh, another pattern you will see is that Wundt trained the first generation of say, psychologists with his concepts of sensation and perception. But when the psychology or the um, approach to understanding psychology moved from Germany to the United States, most people tried to make it more practical. So they didn't bring home Wundt's ideas to the United States. They, they adapted them to make them more meaningful or, or practical. And ultimately the American spirit is to focus on that which works. So to be very pragmatic about things. So um, I mentioned today's lesson is all about applied psychology. So uh, wh what is the laboratory for an applied psychologist? Well, the laboratory is everywhere. So you will see psychologists start to work in the schools. They'll start to work in factories, advertising agencies, uh, courthouses uh, for forensic psychology. And then you start to see clinics and mental health centers develop. Now, it's interesting. We in, in New York, um, we take for granted the deep, rich history uh, of psychology that we have. Uh, much of the applied psychology was happening in New York. So many of the early clinics happened in New York. Um, a lot of the early uh, tests that were created were people who were New York State psychologists and so forth. Uh, and we just take it for granted. Uh, so it's interesting. So as the zeitgeist shifts in the world and in America, so does psychology. So you start to see by 1900, uh, about a quarter or 25% of research was focused to more applied issues. Uh, and only about 3% was focused on introspection, which was the kind of research that Von was into. So uh, looking at American psychology, if we go through a certain key time periods, in 1880, there were no labs in the United States, right? So uh, Wilhelm Wundt sets up the first lab in Germany, 
But by 1900, there were 41 labs in the United States. And by 1900, if we compare that 41 labs to what was happening in Europe, all of Europe only had uh, 10 labs. So we were starting to see a shift towards from Germany being the epicenter of development of psychology to America and American psychology being at the forefront. So that's the first thing we see is a shift in number of labs. We also see that there were in 1880, no journals in the United States. Most journals were written in German actually uh, in the 1880s. By 1895, we have three American journals for psychology. Again, uh, in the 1880s, um, now you're probably like, well, why 1880s? Well, uh, you may remember that it was 1879 that Wundt set up the first laboratory, right? So uh, 1880 is an important number. So in 1880, any American psychologist that wanted to study had to go to Germany to learn psychology, typically under Wundt by 1900, most students were staying in the United States. And between the years of 1892 and 1904, over 100 PhDs were awarded in psychology. Uh, and again, here to give you an idea of journals, 1910, over half of the professional journals were published in German. By the 1930s, only about 14% or one seventh of the journals were published in German. And then by then the American journals took over. So the, while psychology was quite popular, it's interesting, uh, most psychology departments were housed in a philosophy department, right? So when you think about it, to have your own designated department, we didn't start out with, and that's also one explanation why the early degrees that people received in psychology were called PhDs or doctorates in philosophy because historically psychology was housed in the philosophy department. Um, now, there were certain places that did have a psychology department. Columbia University had a psychology department and if you look at the, you know, the activity of Thorndike and, and um, many other individuals uh, at Columbia University or Teachers College as it's called today, uh, it was pretty robust. Then you had Clark University, Chicago University, and then the University of Illinois. Now, interesting to note, Harvard, which now is considered one of the prestige psychology departments with researchers like uh, Mazarin uh, Banerjee and earlier researchers with Lawrence Kohlberg and whatnot. They didn't even have their own department to until the 1930s. So let's talk about uh, the uh, introduction of psychology to uh, the American public. So uh, psychology makes its first uh, appearance or its debut at the, Ch uh, the Chicago World's Fair uh, in 1893. Uh, they had a whole bunch of physiological measures and similar to when we talked about Darwin and Galton, how Galton had the anthropometric laboratory in London. Well, uh, in the Chicago World's Fair, we also had a lot of these measures of sensory acuity um, that was there. Now, in terms of St. Louis, we had the Louisiana Purchase Expedition in 1904. And here is where you had some of the most prominent psychologists of the day there. So Titchener was there, we talked about that. Um, uh, G.S. Hall was there, Morgan was there, Watson was there. Now you may not have heard of these names yet, but you're going to throughout this semester. So uh, when we think about the utility of a degree in psychology, uh, one of the biggest challenges 
that psychology faced uh, up to about the 1920s, if I um, were to estimate, was that we had to demonstrate that we were a useful field and we had to demonstrate that we could make meaningful differences. And why is that? Be the answer is because there were more PhDs awarded in psychology than actual number of labs. So we were granting doctoral degrees to people, but there weren't enough research positions in universities for these doctor, uh, newly minted doctors in psychology to take over. So long story short, uh, we talked about evolution and being adaptive for our economic survival. We needed uh, to find other ways to work beyond the universities. So um, give you an example, uh, Hollingsworth, Hollingworth or Harry Hollingsworth, uh, his university salary was insufficient to live on. So he had to uh, in addition to teaching at Barnard, he, he had to teach at other universities, proctor exams, give seminars on advertising. He had to do a whole bunch of other things to make a living. And it wasn't enough to just be a university professor. So Hollingsworth is just one example of how we had to shift our focus uh, to outside of the universities uh, into other, er other areas of study for economic survival. So again, um, if you were to look at uh, applied psychology, uh, what happened uh, with individuals who didn't have a university that was fully funded? Well, uh, oftentimes uh, you, we tend to see their labs were under funded or poorly equipped. And uh, about a third of psychologists of that day um, were actually working in universities that they were underfunded. All right, so doing your research would have been impaired or hindered if you were at one of these universities. So, all right, so now let's find um, a better way or approach to demonstrate our, our value. And one of the hopes is that if we could demonstrate that psychology had some financial worth other than being a professor, then the idea, the hope was that maybe politicians and administrators would increase the budget uh, and increase faculty's uh, salaries so that they can have a living wage. So what's the solution? Well, uh, one thing that's happening at the end of the 1800s and the beginning of the 1900s is the mandate that all children go to school. So uh, once you have this boom in public school enrollment, uh, then you have issues around education. So uh, when we look at the public school enrollment, it jumped from 7 million students to 20 million students. So as a function of that, the government, government put more money into education. So what happened? Psychologists found the first avenue or applied avenue in the, in the field of educational psychology. So um, about a third of psychologists in 1910 wanted to study education. And it's interesting, Columbia University, if you look at most of their early work, uh, they did a lot of work on educational psychology, the application of psychology to education in schools. They did a lot of work on testing and so forth. So all of a sudden, um, that which was a threat to our existence, we find an opportunity in the school system. So all of a sudden we start to do educational work, business work, testing, and so forth. So let's talk about Hall. You may recall that I just mentioned his name, uh, Granville Stanley Hall, or G.S. Hall. Um, 
it has a, a lot of number ones in American psychology. So here we're no longer looking at our early days in Germany. Um, we see some significant uh, firsts for GS Hall. So he gets the first American doctoral degree in psychology. He founds the first uh, journal, American Journal of Psychology. He becomes the first president of Clark University. He becomes the first president of the American Psychological Association. He's one of the first applied psychologists and uh, there's a debate whether it was him or William James who had the first la American lab, uh, psychology lab. All right, so for those who uh, say that G.S. Hall is the first, uh, who created the first psych lab, here's just a picture of what his lab looked like. Uh, again, there was a lot of emphasis on, you know, physiology and whatnot at the beginning, so it doesn't shock me that his lab would look something like this. All right, so let's learn a little bit about G.S. Hall's life. So um, by 14, he felt that need to make a difference on the world. So he, he vows to do something um, with, the, with uh, his, his life. So he makes a commitment that he's gonna make some kind of uh, meaningful impact on the world. Um, when he's 17, uh, he gets um, drafted for the Civil War, but his dad purchases a draft exemption for him. Uh, so he doesn't have to fight in the Civil War. Um, he demonstrates frustration or disappointment in his father that he did that. Ultimately, he winds up going to um, Williams College in 1863, received many honors, uh, was considered by those around him as the smartest person in his class. Um, and then he enrolls in Union Theological Seminary, thinking he's gonna do uh, spiritual work. But ultimately, that's not where he makes his mark, obviously. So what happens? What shifts? Well, the first thing he does in 1874 is he reads uh, an early uh, book on psychology or Wundt's book on physiological psychology, piqued his curiosity, and then he ultimately uh, gets a PhD uh, in psychology, the first uh, American PhD. And then he studies space perception. Again, it does not shock me, nor should it shock you that he starts with sensation perception because that's where many of the early uh, psychologists focused on, a right? physiological psych. Uh, so he then goes to Europe, works with uh, Vunt in his lab for two years, gets some mentorship there, um, and then he starts to shift years. So in 1882, uh, he gives a talk. Now, pay attention to that date, right? Because 1882 is already very early in the game. He gives a talk to the National Educational Association about applying psychology to education. So that is where he's going to start to make his mark. So um, after giving that talk, he was also invited to speak at Harvard uh, on the, uh, the issue of education, eventually gets uh, an appointment as a professor at John Hopkins University creates his first lab in 1883, uh, and he becomes a mentor. He becomes a mentor to uh, Dewey, uh, James McKean Cattell, which are other major prominent psychologists that follow him. And then he founds the uh, American Journal of Psychology. So this allowed um, psychology in the United States to form its own identity and not be beholden to the German or British spirit. So by 1888, right? So uh, if you look at it, he got his appointment 
um, at John Hopkins, but by 1880, he becomes the first president of Clark University. Um, and then he wanted to start working on um, gr a graduate program. So that becomes what he does. And then he creates another journal and this journal is called the Journal of Pedagogical Seminary. So pedagogy refers to teaching. So uh, when we talk about this journal, it focused on um, research on children's studies and educational psychology. Uh, and then ultimately 1892, he's elected as the first president of the American Psychological Association. Interesting to note, um, in 1900, there are 127 members of the American Psychological Association. Today, there's over 100,000. So uh, psychology in its infancy was very small, but psychology today and the application of psychology is so robust. So um, I think it's... Um, remarkable that psychology has grown by um, a factor of a thousand. All right, so again, you know, um, he's interested in religious psychology. Remember he was uh, dabbling in um, seminary studies. So uh, he creates a journal, a journal of religious psychology. Now, for many of you, uh, you might think that psychology is a science, which it is, and then religion, uh, a lot of things are hard to measure. What place do we have mixing science and religion? Well, the truth is that many early psychologists studied uh, religion and spirituality and its effect on psychological states. It's only when behaviorism becomes very strong that uh, it becomes a taboo to study religion and spirituality and that they, we shift away from it. But in the early stages, look at the people who are interested in the study of religion. We talked about William James. Now you're learning about um, Hall. Um, there was... Co, Starbuck, um, there were sociologists who were interested um, in, in religion, people like Marx. Marx said, um, religion is the opium of the masses. Um, and, and we shift away from it, right? So we might have shifted away from it, but it comes back. And today there's a whole um, bend of research that's just focused on religion and spirituality. And actually uh, that is one of my areas of interest. So I think it's pretty cool. All right, so 1909, um, Freud and, and Jung come uh, across the sea and they present uh, at the 20th anniversary of Clark University. And in their presentations, obviously Freud is the, the founder of psychoanalysis and Jung is one of his key uh, disciples. They start to inspire interest in psychoanalysis. And I want, to re I want you to remember this point because when we talk about Freud and Freud's view of himself and Freud's view of, you know, psychoanalysis and what the world thought of it, he couldn't have been more wrong. He thought that people didn't like psychoanalysis. He thought that uh, people thought it was just uh, some kind of fringe, um, fringe discipline. But believe it or not, in America, psychoanalysis um, captures the mind of the American spirit. And it becomes very strong in many parts of America, especially uh, places like New York, which uh, many of the early pioneers like Adler and Horney and, and so many other people had clinics in, um, in New York City. And um, many of the early training sites of psychoanalysis were New York City. 
but I digress. So uh, Freud was being celebrated. Uh, Jung was being celebrated in her work and it gets traction in America. So in 1915, he founds the Journal of Applied Psychology. This is, this is good for us because now it, you have a journal where you can publish things about the application of psychology to education, law, workforce, and so forth. Um, before that, you might not have had that, right? So, and in 1915, we have a total of 16 American journals. Now that too uh, has uh, blossomed and grown a lot, right? Um, one of the things that we see is that there are thousands of journals related to psychology. If you go to EBSCOhost and you click the number of journals, it's remarkable. Now, uh, Hall served as president of Clark University for 36 years. And in that time, there were 81 doctoral degrees granted in psychology. Um, he seemed uh, he received a lot of accolades. He was viewed by his students as warm, generous, supportive. Um, he put an emphasis on opening up doors for females and ethnic minorities. Um, to give you an example, uh, women were admitted as grad students and part of the faculty there and, uh, and so forth. Now, one factoid is that um, Sumner, which was a student of Hall, becomes the first African-American to receive a PhD in psychology. All right, so in terms of uh, evolution and, and the recapitulation theory of development, he, he became convinced that there was a normal growth of the mind and it in, involves several, several stages, evolutionary stages. Now, I do think that um, it's important to talk about some of the controversy around him too, right? Because he was viewed as a, a genetic psychologist. He was interested in um, human and animal development and adaptation, but one of the controversies around many early psychologists was that they endorsed something called eugenics, which basically believed that the differences between people are part of the genetic code. And you know, many of the outgrowths of this are that people suggested not to mix genes so uh, you can see the application to racism there. Uh, and uh, you could see when it comes to genes and genetics and IQ that uh, in the early stages, there was sterilization and, um, and infanticide, right? Uh, so they would either sterilize people who had low IQ uh, or if they knew they might even terminate the child. So uh, being a genetic psychologist, you know, and applying it to human and animal development isn't the whole story. There is also um, a darker side of this, which, which is eugenics. Uh, he did um, study childhood development, which became his uh, focus. So when we talk about developmental psychology, a lot of his work is useful. Uh, in total, he creates a series of 194 test instruments. And keep in mind, another one of the uh, major applications of psychology is in the testing movement. So Hall is responsible for part of that. So, all right. So uh, when we look at children, um, his early studies on children were exciting, but uh, a lot of his research was poorly executed. And as a function of that, that excitement started to wean. And one of his theories was something called the recapitulation theory, um, 
And that is to say psychological development of children repeats uh, the history of the human race. So we start off uh, similar to the way we started in, um, in society. Uh, and he suggested that infants and children were more savage-like uh, or primitive. And if you look back in the history of the human race, he argued that we were more primitive earlier on. And then as you move from childhood to adulthood, you become more civilized, similar to um, as we've developed in society. Now, even the recapitulation theory um, is controversial today. If someone said that today, it would be considered uh, quite offensive. So um, another one of his publications, and not just on childhood, is he wrote a book on adolescence. And adolescence, he started to talk about sex uh, and the experience. Um, and his colleagues like Thorndike started to criticize him because of this focus on sex. Um, uh, and, and, but it was, it was sort of, um, people were curious about this. So uh, he started giving lectures at Clark University. Um, he thought um, it would be um, not an honorable thing to have women at these lectures. So he didn't have uh, women at these lectures on sex, which the application of sexism there. Um, but eventually he stops because people would start to, uh, to listen at the door. And then eventually he starts focusing on old age or uh, senescence, right? And um, as he became older, he became more interested in the aging process. So the next person we'll talk about, so that's Hall, which has a lot of firsts and um, especially in American psychology. So let's talk about James McKean Cattell. He also focused on a very practical test oriented uh, understanding of mental processes um, he cared more about mental processes than just pure consciousness that Vunt and Titchener were looking at. So um, a little bit about his life. He was born in 1860 in Easton, Pennsylvania. Got his uh, bachelor's degree from Lafayette College and eventually goes to Europe. Um, for graduate studies, uh, winds up in Leipzig uh, University, which is where Uvunt is at the time. And he writes a paper on philosophy in 1882, which gets him a fellowship at John Hopkins University, um, which is in Baltimore. Uh, so what was his interest? His interest was trying um, trying to understand mental states and the, the, the impact of various drugs on mental states. So things like marijuana or morphine or opium or caffeine, tobacco, chocolate. Cattell was kind of curious about that. And at John Hopkins, he enrolls in Hall's lab course. And then he starts to do research on reaction time. Uh, now, again, early psychology. We're right back to that uh, physiological approach, right? So when he takes this course, he becomes interested uh, in becoming a psychologist. He winds up uh, going back to Germany, becomes a lab assistant for Wilhelm Wundt. Um, and his research on individual difference was considered an American uh, project, so to speak. Ultimately, in 1886, he gets his PhD and Vunt makes him the head of his laboratory. Uh, and then he returns to the United States to uh, teach at Bryn Mawr College and the University of Pennsylvania. Now keep the University of Pennsylvania, um, that university's name there too, 
because in early New York psychology, I guess the first two presidents of New York State Psychological Association were from the University of Pennsylvania. So it's interesting how we had to import our talent in the beginning because it was such a small field. So he goes on to lecture at Cambridge University. He meets Galton there. And all of a sudden he becomes interested in quantifying things like stress, uh, developing rating scales and ranking scales. Um, Cattell also becomes uh, interested in eugenics and uh, he profoundly believed that people who had defects should be sterilized so that they can't pass on any genetic mutation that they have, um, which today would not be acceptable, obviously, but uh, it's amazing the difference that 100, 120 years makes. Our mindset is quite different. Uh, and because he was so strongly believing in eugenics, uh, he thought that the higher intellectual individuals were in academia. So he offered his children $1,000 if they married a college professor, right? And $1,000 in um, the turn of the last century, right? So the late 1800s, early 1900s. So he becomes a full professor at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, so how did he get it? One of the uh, ways that he got it was his father advocated for him. Um, again, he was born in Eastern Pennsylvania. So uh, his dad had a lot of connections in Pennsylvania. He also had recommendations, high recommendation letters. Uh, one of which was from Wilhelm Wundt. Right, so getting a letter from the founding father of psychology carries a lot of weight. But uh, he doesn't stay there that long. So from 1888 to 1891, he stays at UPenn. Uh, and then in 1891, he moves to New York to head Chicago, uh, pardon me, Columbia University Psychology Department. So he also creates um, journals. So he find, uh, founds the journal Psychological Review. Uh, and this was because he did not, um, he didn't, he was unhappy with G.S. Hall's American Journal of Psychology. So cre creates another avenue for people to publish. Um, eventually he buys the journal Science uh, from, uh, Alexander Graham Bell, right, who's credited with uh, creating the telephone, even though there's a debate on that. Um, now, science is uh, quite the journal, right? It's still around today. He also uh, purchases in 1900 Popular Science Monthly, which eventually becomes Science Monthly. So during Cattell's tenure, he had more doctorates awarded at Columbia than any other graduate school. And uh, he felt that students should be given freedom and independence to do their work without um, hindering the process of the intellectual growth of their students. So he, he, he had a hands-off approach. So professors, uh, he tended to keep distance from the university, tend to keep distance from the students. Um, and as a function of that, uh, he wound up having conflict with administration. Uh, and uh, to give you an example, the, the strife between him as a professor at Columbia and the administration ultimately results in uh, him helping form the American Association of University Professors, which is still around today To And their job is to lobby and advocate for the rights of professors. Uh, and Cattell's biggest point was that faculty should be making decisions about university governance, not the administration. 
Uh, and uh, that created changes in many universities. Today, we have something called the Faculty Senate. And the Faculty Senate and the, and the Faculty Assembly uh, are responsible for voting different positions. So uh, his position, while confrontational at the time, uh, actually wound up in some meaningful change. So the university eventually, you know, they, they try and get Patel to retire. Um, he doesn't, right? They tried to get him to retire again. He doesn't. They try to get him to retire a third time. He doesn't. So long story short is that on three occasions, uh, Columbia tried to get him to, you know, retire. Uh, in 1917, Ultimately, he uh, becomes dismissed or fired from his post uh, because he didn't support World War I. And what does Cattell do? He sues the university and wins uh, in a lawsuit $40,000. And then he started uh, writing uh, satirical pamphlets or mocking the university. So, but that's not the end of Cattell's life, right? So it, it's the end of his life at Columbia University. So what does he do? He then takes the principles of psychology and promotes it as a business. So he, he founds Psych Corporation or Psychological Corporation, which is one of the early uh, testing companies. And in fact, it's still around today. I believe it was bought out, um, but uh, Psych Corporation is still around today, and, and the early testing movement, he makes a fortune off of, right? So, and, you know, many, you know, he creates stock around this, many psychologists buy it, and uh, ultimately, um, his promoting psychology as a business became quite successful when Psychor was sold to Harcourt Brace, which is another publishing house. Now, one thing that Cattell is credited for is uh, using the term or coining the term mental test, right? So the idea of mental test uh, is a shift from some of the work of GS, some of the early work of GS Hall, some of the work of Wundt and Titchener, where they were looking at sensation and perception and, and physical strength and visual acuity and all of these things and the work of Dalton certainly. And he said, we need to focus not just on the physical processes of an individual, but we need to focus on um, the psychological processes or the mental processes. So um, what does he do? He says, we need to be like all the other sciences and we need to have, use experiments and do large scale testing of uh, a large group of individuals. Now, if you've taken statistics, you probably have heard of the bell curve, uh, also known as the normal distribution. You can only get uh, meaningful data about the population from a large sample. Uh, then you can norm reference your test. So we're talking about getting thousands of people in a given study to um, better understand a psychological process. All right. Now his test, even though he coins the term mental test, uh, they still tended to focus more on the sensory motor aspects. Um, now in 1901, he collects enough data to link or correlate uh, sensory motor task with cognition. And as one um, would not be surprised to hear, the correlation is pretty low. So uh, remember Galton's anthropometric laboratory where he would have you squeeze something as strong as you can or breathe out uh, for lung capacity what does it have to do with intellect or what does it have to do with academic performance? 
uh, by 1901, he discovers that studying just physical or sensory motor tasks had little uh, to do with or was a very poor predictor of academic performance and intelligence. So uh, what was his influence? He becomes an ambassador of psychology. He lectures throughout the world. Uh, he uh, creates a few journals, buys a journal or two, uh, and then um, becomes one of the major in influences of the testing movement. So um, who were his students? Well, his students were Woodworth and Thorndike, and Thorndike actually also winds up staying at Columbia University. And uh, another thing that was beneficial for Cattell or his influence was uh, introducing mental testing to the United States, right? Because the first psychological test or mental test that was created was actually Alfred Binet. And Alfred Binet, uh, his purpose, he was hired by the French ministry because France also went to the public school model uh, to determine which children could benefit from regular education and which children would need special education. So even though Cattell coined the term mental test, the first real uh, psychological test of mental ability was actually Alfred Binet, right? So things like intelligence um, is far more complex. So uh, who's Alfred Binet? I think I alluded to this a bit. Um, Alfred Binet was fairly wealthy. He was a self-taught psychologist, uh, highly published. He published over 200 articles and books. And he moved away from sensory motor as well as uh, physiological processes to measure human cognitive abilities. So um, he has more sophisticated or complex measures to measure intelligence. And ultimately, Alfred Binet is credited with formally starting the intelligence testing movement. So Binet, again, um, highly influential in the field of developmental psychology. You can't go through developmental psychology without hearing about him, experimental psychology. Uh, he's less known for that, but he did contribute. Educational psychology and social psychology. All of these subfields of psychology that we know today, his work is highly influential. So what did he do? So instead of focusing on physical strength and sensory motor activities, he started to focus on aspects of cognitive ability such as memory, attention, imagination and creativity, comprehension and whatnot. And uh, that was profound. That was very helpful in um, developing psychological tests. Now, uh, one of his arguments uh, was based on testing his two daughters. And what he found was that his two young daughters performed very similar to adults on sensory motor tasks, but they did not perform uh, as well on these cognitive tests of memory, attention, comprehension, and so forth. So it's clear that one's cognitive abilities can't just be about physical abilities. So by 1904, he's hired by the French ministry um, with Theodore Simon. It's interesting, Theodore Simon uh, gets very little credit, even though he was there from the beginning, um, to develop a test that would uh, address the problem of regular ed and who could benefit from regular ed, who could benefit from special ed. And so what did he do? He created a 30 item test and each item was of increasing level of difficulty. And he scored, well, what level did you get up to? And 
depending on that level, because he gave this test to so many people, he was able to calculate a mental age. And that mental age was, well, at what level, um, at what level did you perform and what age group would that put you in? So it's possible that you might have been a six-year-old um, and performed at an eight-year-old level because your judgment, comprehension, reasoning was higher than um, your age mate, so to speak. So, but here's the deal. The uh, move from, uh, from uh, IQ testing in France to America uh, has some significant impacts. So one place it goes to uh, is uh, Henry Goddard. Henry Goddard translates the test and starts working with people with low IQ in Vineland, New Jersey. You might have heard of the Vineland School. Well, that, that was actually Goddard, or you might have heard of the Goddard School, right? Now, Goddard is a highly controversial figure in psychology as well because he used intelligence testing to suggest um, superiority amongst various races or immigrants. So what do I mean by that? Goddard took Binet's test to Ellis Island. And when he took this test to Ellis Island, he tested new immigrants uh, on IQ and as it would not shock you because all tests at this time had a language factor, uh, those uh, immigrants who came from cultures that were more similar to the United States or had the same language tended to do better than those individuals who migrated from other parts of Europe. And he argued that um, uh, Northern European individuals were somehow inherently smarter. Uh, and uh, that's a bias. And it, there are so many problems with that. Number one, uh, the test itself was culturally biased. Um, number two, uh, taking a test in a, um, another language, even with a translator, um, some things get lost in translation. And number three, people didn't move from one part of the world to the other the same way we do today. If you wanted to get from um, Italy to the United States, you hop on a plane, you get there. Um, in the early 1900s, you were on a boat and you might've been on a boat for several weeks, bobbing at sea. So you could have dizziness, nausea, and people respond differently to that environment. Also, refrigeration was not what it is today, right? So because um, people use uh, salting or pickling um, to preserve food or they had ice slabs, uh, it, the refrigeration processes weren't as good. So you could have people coming off a boat with seasickness or some actual um, indigestion and you're saying here take this test so long story short this is problematic and then the other place it goes which is less problematic is lewis terman takes it to stanford university he reformulates the uh, benet and simon scale and then ultimately the test becomes the stanford benet test now remember how i said uh, Theodore Simon doesn't get enough credit. The test today remains the Stanford Binet test. So many people who don't know the history of testing uh, don't know that there was a guy by the name of Theodore Simon who played a role in this. So uh, now Lewis Terman was more interested in uh, high levels of intelligence and long-term outcomes. So he, he used this test to to follow kids into adolescence, adulthood, and so forth, and see if they had, 
higher intelligence individuals tended to do better. Another person, instead of referring to just mental age, William Stern added the term IQ or intelligence quotient. And IQ is just a number. Now, instead of just having an age bracket, we have a number. And what we know about IQ today is the average IQ is 100. So uh, how do we do that? Well, here's the formula. You take a person's mental age, which was how they performed on a test, as we said earlier with Binet, divide that by their chronological age, how old they are based on their birth certificate, and then multiply that by 100. So I so said the average IQ is 100. Let's take a person who's 10 years old and they perform at the 10 year old level. 10 divided by 10 equals one. One times 100 equals 100. So that's how the middle point the bell of the bell curve uh, is 100. Then we have another fella, um, Robert Yerkes. Uh, he starts to apply testing to the military. Um, and Robert Yerkes during World War I, um, he was the president of APA and he was asked to create a test that was uh, useful for screening out military recruits so that they could decide which military personnel would be in an infantry unit, which military personnel would be in intel, which military personnel might be peeling potatoes. So as a function of this, he comes up with the Army Alpha and Beta tests. And the, uh, it's a multiple choice test and it was just designed to screen recruits in a group fashion. Again, uh, when you're at war and you need a lot, of, um, a lot of individuals to work at the same time, you can't test them one by one like most tests are done. Uh, in this case, you're gonna do group testing. So the alpha version was for English speaking individuals or literate individuals. And then the beta version of the test was for either non-English speaking individuals or people who are not literate. And it was designed to, as I said, screen out the recruits. Now, I will tell you that he received uh, commendations from uh, the Department of Defense uh, for his work on testing. Uh, he gets a lot of credit for that. Um, but nevertheless, this is, this was one of the commitments to the military at that time. The next person we're going to talk about in terms of testing is Robert Woodworth. Now I mentioned Robert Woodworth already. Um, actually I didn't forgive me. Uh, he developed the personal data sheet, which was designed to screen neurosis. It was also a group test uh, and it became a model for other group tests in the future. So as you're hearing, a lot of people from Cattell to Binet uh, to Yerkes to, to Woodworth, you have a whole bunch of individuals working on psychological testing. And psychological testing becomes one of the key advances uh, for psychology and makes us more versatile and it makes us more likely for our profession to survive. So just to give you an idea, in the 1920s, over uh, 4 million IQ tests were purchased per year. That's a lot. Um, in 1923, a half a million copies of the Stanford Binet test alone was copied. And then uh, the Pressy team, uh, they create a whole bunch of um, tests. So uh, Luella Cole and Sidney Pressy um, work together as husband and wife, and they created 47 different tests on their own. And 12 million of their tests were administered to school children. So just think about that. Uh, we went from being, so far, being a discipline that only studied sensation and perception, that 
the doctoral degrees were only uh, for people who are going to eventually work in the universities and, and university laboratories to being able to help people in schools, to being able to help create a testing movement, a screening testing movement for a whole host of psychological conditions and working with the US military. Um, these are three shifts in focus already in applied psychology. So um, when you think about testing, they used um, terms that kind of gave them credibility. So instead of saying uh, test examinee, which is the language we use, use today, they used the term patient, right? And it was important to use that term because we borrow credibility from the medical community by referring to people being tested as patients. Uh, we also refer to IQ tests as sort of like an x-ray machine of the mind. People got that, they understood x-rays. And then schools were education factories. So really trying to say, well, hey, psychology is here, but we're gonna speak the language that you better understand or, or you understand more. Uh, from medicine and engineering. So as I mentioned, uh, Henry Goddard uh, took Binet's tests and he went to Ellis Island with it and he tested immigrants and he wanted, his goal was to keep out anyone who was mentally defective from the United States. So he only wanted people with high IQ in the United States and anyone who was uh, mentally defective, uh, according to his term, should not be granted uh, immigration. So what did he find? Well, he found that 87% uh, of Russians, 83% of Jews, 80% of Hungarians, and 79% of Italians had an IQ or mental age less than 12, right? So he also found um, that whites tended to do better than ethnic minorities. And in, he used his testing to suggest uh, an inherent superiority of whites over ethnic minorities. Again, uh, highly controversial and problematic. So when we, do, when we think about some of the negative consequences of testing, um, we have to talk about eugenics and we have to talk about racism because embedded in early uh, testing, we see both of these happening. And so we, um, we do see um, prejudice, discrimination and racism in the work of Henry Goddard. So, all right, so again, what are some of the criticisms uh, we argue that um, some of the differences in IQ that Goddard saw were due to environmental differences, not genetic differences. It should not shock you that Northern European individuals did better on Goddard's IQ tests than Eastern European, as you saw in the data from the previous slide. And one of the issues is that uh, if people didn't speak the English language, the test is biased against them. And because many of the early IQ tests were heavily loaded on language and culture, if you came from a different culture, you're more likely to underperform. Now, uh, another interesting research study was done by Horace Bond, which kind of challenges uh, this idea of white superiority. And again, you, by now you're familiar with it from lesson one, we talked about the prejudice against women, ethnic minorities and, and Jews and religious minorities. We've already talked about this, but you've seen some of the struggles women faced breaking into the field uh, already in the previous lecture. But in addition to to that, 
you're now starting to see the experiences of ethnic minorities uh, and how they were viewed by society. But one, one really cool study was demonstrating that the tests were biased and Horace Bond demonstrated that blacks in Northern states outperform whites in Southern states. So if whites were truly uh, inherently more intelligent than blacks and whites should always outperform blacks. So how do we explain uh, this difference between blacks in the North and whites in the South and how blacks outperform whites? It's simple. Think of the environment. Look at the research. It was 1904 to 1972. Uh, Pre-civil rights movement, uh, blacks in the South were treated as second-class citizens. They were not given the same uh, opportunities in education. They were not given the same opportunities um, in the classrooms. They uh, constantly in, in threat for their life. But blacks in the North tended to have, they still struggled. I'm not gonna say that they didn't, but they had more opportunity. So if, they, if there was integration in Northern states, they're gonna um, benefit from the same kind of education and perform better. So when there was this racial bias or prejudice happening, you can uh, debunk the theory by showing, hey, if you give ethnic minorities a fair chance, equal opportunity, then they're gonna perform equal to and sometimes better than other ethnicities. And that's why I love Horace Bond's research because it really uh, chips away at the belief that whites are inherently superior. Now that controversy disappears for quite some time until we get the book, um, The Bell Curve. And The Bell Curve, um, was a book written by, I want to say Murray, and some other research by a cognitive psychologist by the name of Arthur Jensen, who argued that IQ tests are not uh, culturally biased. Um, and the, as a function of saying they're not culturally biased, the results in any difference that would occur in IQ uh, was a real difference, was a genetic difference. So thus they concluded that blacks were intellectually inferior to whites. This book remains controversial. Um, and uh, I'll argue against this book uh, pretty easily. So let's start with the idea that um, school systems, let's start with the school system. The opportunities and enrichment a school has is based on tax dollars. So schools that are in middle-class neighborhood and upper-class neighborhood have more uh, money put into the schools, even if it's a public school, than uh, low-income communities. And unfortunately, ethnic minorities are disproportionately in low-income brackets. So as a function of that, from early childhood, they're disadvantaged uh, in the school system. Uh, another issue is, again, where uh, when a child is having challenges. If you have uh, additional money that you can uh, hire a tutor, your child's gonna perform much better than if that money, uh, you're debating whether you should put it towards your rent or something else. So uh, that in a nutshell um, are the criticisms. Now Whitmer, Whitmer is another key player. Um, he's responsible for creating the uh, clinical psychology or application of um, clinical psychology. Um, so he was interested in treating abnormal behavior. Now you may remember that Cattell 
left UPenn and went to Columbia. So there is this connection between uh, Pennsylvania and New York that happens, but Whitmer takes over and he starts to study clinical psychology. He opens up the first clinic. He starts to treat uh, learning and behavioral problems. Um, now, if we were to look at Whitmer and his impact, we would argue that he, you know, he was focused more on school psychology because of learning and behavioral problems and not modern clinical psychology, which is a broader range of psychological disorders. Comes up with the first course in clinical psychology, creates the first clinical psychology journal called Psychological Clinic. So what's his story? So he was born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in 1867, graduated from UPenn, um, returned to uh, UPenn to get a law degree, but uh, he wanted a paid assistantship and ultimately the only assistantship that was paid at that time was under Cattell and Cattell was in a psych department. So uh, Cattell offers um, Whitmer his position, this assistantship, if he agreed to get his PhD from Wilhelm Wundt. So he does. Uh, eventually he took over the position at U UPenn uh, in 1892. And just to give you an idea, a lot of things are happening at this point. This is when Hall starts the American Psychological Association. Titchener's now moved on to Cornell and Hugo Munsterberg is now at Harvard. So uh, what was his first uh, studies on? He started studying pain and reaction time, all right? Does not shock you, again, if he studied under Wundt, early research is gonna be sensation perception kind of studies, uh, a lot of the physiological psychology studies. All right, 1896, uh, the Board of Ed uh, needed psychologists to, to talk about the principles of teaching, so pedagogy. So, um, and it, one of the individuals in the lecture says, well, how would you um, teach a 40 year old boy who couldn't spell? And off to the races we go. So as a function of talking to the Board of Ed and giving these lectures on how to teach people with uh, special needs, Whitmer starts to uh, prepare courses on working with, at that time, what was called the mentally defective or people with IQ, low IQ, intellectual disabilities, people who were blind and people who had psychological disturbances, right? He, as I mentioned, he founded the journal and eventually he separates his clinic from Penn and retires from Penn. So, because he's the first clinical psychologist, Whitmer had no playbook. He had no one to give him direction on how to do it. So the reality is, is that he had to study and develop his strategies as he went along and break a few eggs. So um, he's, he's writing the playbook of this. So Whitmer, uh, he, his clinic showed uh, various conditions and how to treat various conditions such as ADHD, learning disabilities, speech problems, motor problems. And um, he felt the best way to treat conditions was through a team approach that included uh, medical doctors, social workers, psychologists, and so forth. And he also acknowledged the fact that both genetics and environmental factors uh, impact the development of psychological disturbances. All right, just a thought though. So following Whitmer, many psychologists followed his playbook, right? He wrote the playbook. By 1914, there were 14 clinics operating in the United States, most of which 
patterned themselves after Whitmer. Uh, Whitmer, as we know, focused a lot on childhood and school related problems. So some of these clinics extended treatment to adults uh, and that was quite profound, right? So looking at Whitmer, uh, he played a profound role in at the child level uh, in dealing with special education. So the, the, the field of special education owes a debt of gratitude to Whitmer. He also, uh, if we think about the application to adolescents and adults, some people took his model and applied it to vocational training so that people could get jobs. So very, Whitmer is a very profound individual who in, influenced psychology in so many ways. So now if we're keeping score, we have um, educational psychology, testing psychology, we have um, military psychology or working with the military uh, and uh, we have clinical psychology. So we're moving on. So the clinical psychology movement um, also benefited from some other individuals and, um, and written pieces. So Clifford uh, Beers wrote a book, A Mind That Found Itself. So he talks about his own experience as someone with psychological distress and how, uh, how important humane treatment is in dealing with people who are, have mental illness uh, to help people recover. So his book uh, tells a story from a personal perspective, how one might recover from mental illness. And then Hugo Munsterberg, which we're also going uh, to uh, talk about. He wrote a book called Psychotherapy, which was an early version of trying to explain how to treat various mental illnesses. Um, some of his work we wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't do today, but again, look at the date, it's 1909. And then the first child guidance clinic was created to address problems in childhood so that they don't continue uh, in adulthood. We also see Freudian psychoanalysis um, is quite crucial here. It's the first uh, systematic approach to treat mental illness, so psychotherapy. Freud gets credit for. Uh, but if we were to look at it, it was fairly slow moving as, a, as an applied discipline. In 1918, there were no uh, PhDs in clinical psychology. And even by 1940, clinical psychology was fairly small. And then 1941 happens. 1941 is a uh, powerful time in American history because of the bombing of Pearl Harbor and the United States uh, entering in World War II. And World War II was a very um, traumatic experience for uh, many soldiers. So the army started to pay for training programs to help treat people with um, psychological needs. So um, I want to put it into perspective. So let's fast forward uh, from 1941 to the end of World War II. At the end of World War II, there were 40,000 soldiers who needed psychiatric treatment. There were 3 million individuals who needed vocational training. And, and I want you to understand vocational training, why? If these were soldiers, couldn't they just get their job back when they came back from war? The answer is no. There were not the same level of protections that we have today. If you are uh, a soldier who goes to war today, people can't fire you, you have protections. But uh, back in that day, it wasn't so clear. So you had a whole, 3 million people needing vocational training. And then you had 
over 300,000 or 315,000 people needing assistance and how to cope with some form of a physical or psychological disability. So what happens? The Department of Veterans Affairs comes in and starts to fund graduate level uh, programming for clinical psych. And this was a game changer. Once the government starts putting money into psychology, now uh, the field of clinical psychology can shift away from just ADHD, learning disorders, adjustment problems, and really address the full spectrum of psychological disorders. Right? And today the DSM has over 400 conditions. So uh, the VA is very responsible for uh, enhancing the value of a psychology degree. Now, a little bit of a fun fact, the Veterans Affairs or VA remains the largest employer of psychologists even to this day. Every VA has a uh, psychologist, right? Because many times veterans come out not the same way they went in. So we need support for our soldiers, our vets. And uh, by the end of World War II uh, and moving into the 50s and 60s, clinical psychology becomes the largest of all the applied psychology subfields. And today there are hundreds, if not um, thousands of psychology programs throughout the nation who offer either master's or doctoral degrees in clinical or applied psychology. Let's move to Walter Dill Scott. Uh, Walter Dill Scott is another student of Wundt, and he's responsible for taking psychology and applying it to business. So if you were to think of industrial and organizational psychology, well, that's Walter Dill Scott's um, claim to fame. So he wrote the first book on advertising and applying psych the principles of psychology to business. He also uh, was the first uh, person to have the title of professor of applied psychology. Now, if you look at some universities, they actually have a, an applied psychology department. So the whole focus is teaching psychology in a practical way that it's useful when you get your degree. He creates a first consulting company and he gets uh, another individual who receives commendation, receives the Distinguished Service Medal from the US Army. And that's interesting because he was not a vet. He didn't receive it as a veteran, he received it for his work as a psychologist. So Scott was born in Illinois in 1869, and he was struck uh, about, he, he observed working on the farm and how people just wasted time. So he was kind of like, well, is, are there ways to make working on the farm a little bit more efficient? Because he felt that, um, if anyone, including himself, was going to mount to anything, he had to stop wasting time. So uh, very struck from a young age on how to become more efficient. So eventually uh, he wants to, to go to the university and uh, he, he's, a, he's a farm boy, right? He doesn't have a lot of money. So what does he do? Uh, he takes odd jobs to earn tuition money. And he had no problem picking and canning cranberries and uh, uh, getting scrap metal, tutoring. He did anything and everything possible to pay for his tuition. Um, also um, interested in service. So he chose to become a missionary in China. That was going to be his career. Bad news. Uh, there were no vacancies when he wanted to do that. So what does he do? He shifts gears to psychology. So ultimately, he eventually saves enough money to get married and he gets his uh, PhD in Germany. Interesting to note, 
Uh, he's getting his PhD in psychology while his wife is earning her PhD in literature just 20 miles uh, away. And both were hardworking, so they only saw each other on the weekends. At least that's the story going. <laughs> now, eventually he receives his PhD and goes to Northwestern and starts uh, teaching psychology, um, applied psychology and addressing the issues of education. And eventually he starts switching gears to marketing. And he started to think that psychology could offer something meaningful to marketing. So he wrote uh, a book, The Theory and Practice of Advertising, which at that time was the first book on marketing. Um, 1905, he gets promoted to full professor. 1909, he becomes professor of advertising. By 1916, he moves to Carnegie Mellon uh, to become an applied psychology professor at Carnegie's Technical University. Um, 1917, he starts also helping with selecting personnel for World War I. Um, in the beginning, he wasn't well received, but like, as I mentioned, he received the Distinguished Service Medal from the Army by the end of it. And ultimately, he forms the Scott Company, as in his name, to offer consulting in hiring and efficiency practices. So some interesting findings that he he led to and his research led to. Uh, he believed that because many humans don't act rationally, they could be influenced. So if you talk to their emotions or you garner sympathy uh, or you work with suggestible people, then people are more likely to buy things. So if you have emotional hook or sentiment uh, or you're sentimental, people become more suggestible. He also felt that uh, women were more suggestible or persuadable than men at that time. Uh, he discovered that if you give people commands or use the imperative, they actually do it. So just two applications, uh, Coca-Cola, their slogan is drink Coke. Uh, and just because they tell you drink Coke, what do you do? You say, okay. I'm going to drink Coke, right? So you follow their command. Or Nike. Nike was a very small company in Oregon. They came up with a slogan, just do it. Do what? I still don't know what just do it is. I guess it meant to buy sneakers. So just do it. As something as simple as a command, um, people do it. And Nike is the leading um, a retailer of shoes in America, right? Uh, start as a small company in Oregon. They might have had a little bit of help from a mediocre basketball player. What was his name? Oh yeah, Michael Jordan. Just kidding, right? So, but uh, the idea of an imperative, people follow imperatives. Uh, they also, um, use strategies of getting people connected or hooked through mail-in rebates or free samples. So people don't realize the value of rebates, but if you fill out a rebate to get money off that they would have given you anyway, instead of the instant rebate, which people are doing today, uh, but a mail-in rebate, it takes time and energy to fill out, fill out that uh, mail-in rebate. And when you do that, you become more invested in that product. So you're more likely to use that product in the future. So um, things like mail-in rebates become useful. All right, so ultimately he creates a series of tests that measure uh, successful employees. He comes up with a series of characteristics. Um, similar to uh, Leitner Whitmer, um, Walter Dill Scott had no previous information 
he is doing this on the fly, no guidance. Um, and then ultimately he started creating these ranking scores and the qualities that were ne uh, necessary for various uh, subfields or disciplines. And sure enough, um, he developed testing that could show how you would apply your intelligence to real world situations. All right. So IO movement, the impact of the war, again, uh, Scott helped develop rating skills to uh, select army captains. Uh, the, by the end of World War I, he evaluated 3 million soldiers and it had its uh, profound impact. World War II and IO, uh, well, here's where we start to get engineering psychology. Uh, so we start to increase um, testing and screening recruits. Uh, technology became more sophisticated, so aircrafts became more complex, needed highly skilled individuals to operate the aircrafts in World War II, so, we, so testing became important. Uh, and as military products became um, increasingly developed. There were topics like ergonomics that became important. So we, not only do you want equipment, but you want equipment that's tailored to the person that, that are comfortable. Now, when you think about um, engineering psychology and ergonomics, it's not just the military today, right? It, there are many areas where ergonomics matter, furniture, so when you think of um, chairs and how they're shaped, they might receive consultation about comfort and the psychology around it. Uh, keyboards, dashboards, et cetera, all involve engineering psychology. Now the, the Hawthorne and Hawthorne effect, this is just a, a cool uh, study. It's called Hawthorne because it was uh, an electric company in Hawthorne, Illinois. Um, and they, long story short is that they were looking at job placement and he wanted to match the right person with the right job. So uh, Western Electric became interested in what would increase efficiency in employees. So they messed around with things like temperature and lighting. And ultimately the Hawthorne studies found that more, not just temperature and lighting played a role, but other uh, social and psychological effects were even more important. So what did they do? They messed with lighting, they messed with temperature, and um, they observed you when you were performing. And what they found was that um, workplace output was much greater when you were being observed than when you were not being observed even if you were in a condition with poor lighting or, or hot or cold temperature, being observed changed how you performed and you worked harder when you were being observed and that became known as a Hawthorne effect. So now let's shift gears to Hugo Munsterberg. Hugo Munsterberg um, is not credited for all that he did for psychology. Believe it or not, uh, all of the subfields we talked about, Hugo Munsterberg had some influence over. So very uh, successful as a professor, very successful in the public sphere, wrote uh, tons of pop culture magazine articles and books. He actually was invited to the White House under a Theodore Roosevelt and Taft as a guest. He was a distinguished or honored professor at Harvard. Uh, he became president of both the American Psychological and the American Philosophical Associations. But ultimately by the end of his life, he was criticized and ridiculed. So who was Hugo Munsterberg? All right, well, he's born in Danzig, Germany. Uh, in 
1882, he went to Leipzig to study medicine, uh, but like many people, took a psychology course under Wundt. And as a function of this course, his plans changed. So he got a PhD uh, in Leipzig and then eventually got a second um, medical degree uh, in um, Heidelberg. So he thought, having a PhD MD would better equip him for a career in research. So he started writing articles on psychophysics. Uh, now, um, because Wundt was interested in sensation perception and Munsterberg was interested in cognition, uh, Wundt started to criticize his work uh, because they, they focus more on the cognitive aspects of the mind, but nevertheless, as I said earlier, he is quite popular with students. Uh, students appreciated Munsterberg's work. Um, ultimately, William James, which we talked about last lecture, uh, entices him to come to Harvard and work in his laboratory. He was paid very well. And um, he worked under William James. Now, what's interesting is that Munsterberg initially struggled shifting from the pure psychophysics research to the applied psycho psychology research, which was part of the American spirit. So in 1902, he writes a book called American, uh, American Traits, which tries to explain psychological, sociological, and cultural factors within American society. Prolific writer, he finishes this book in uh, less than a month, over 400 pages, uh, quite profound. Um, receives a lot of accolades and um, credit for this book. So he says, well, maybe, maybe as a future in writing uh, and writing to the public as his audience. So he starts to shift gears from psychophysics and his early work in Germany to applied psychology. So what does he write about? He writes about courtroom trials, the uh, justice system, advertising, um, vocational or occupational counseling, mental health, business, and movies. So look at the breadth of Hugo Munsterberg and, and all the things that he addressed. Now, in all fairness, he never shied away from controversy and keep in mind that um, he goes from well-received person to persona non grata by the end of his career. So let's look at some of the things that might have tweaked people. So um, he frequently made comments about individuals guilt or innocence when they were on trial. Even if he was not a juror, he would write about it in a public sphere. He opposed prohibition, right? So when people were trying to ban alcohol, uh, he, he opposed prohibition. And he wrote that alcohol in moderation could be beneficial. Now, there's one problem. Slightly after he made that statement, just a few days later, he received a $50,000 donation. I'm not sure if that was pay for, for play, uh, but nevertheless, it did. the optics are very bad, assuming maybe he made that claim for that money. He also had controversial views on women. Now he was very supportive of women as graduate students at Harvard, but he had no problem saying that graduate work was too hard for them and that they should not be trained for careers because it took them out of the house or as jurors, women shouldn't be jurors because they're not rational. So he was overtly sexist in, in many of his statements. Now making these kind of statements created tension between Hugo Munsterberg and Harvard's president. So um, they're not liking that. They're trying to mediate that Ultimately, um, World War I becomes a breaking point. 
because during World War I, uh, many of the local newspapers were suggesting maybe Hugo Munsterberg is a German spy. So um, this creates tension to want to fire Hugo Munsterberg. So alumni start to offer a $10 million endowment. Again, keep in mind, this is the early 1900s. What was $10 million? It was a lot, right? Still a lot, actually. But $10 million they would give if they just fired him. Now, um, Hugo Munsterberg hears that alumni are offering to give money for him to be fired. And he says, tongue in cheek, well, if you give that $5 million immediately, I'll resign right now. So he kind of um, flipped this, the, the script or flipped it around on the alumni. And obviously that results in greater embarrassment, right? So that's kind of the story of his life and how he went from being well-received and writing all these pop culture books and eventually getting a position at Harvard to wanting to be run out of town. So what were some of his claims to fame? Well, he uh, helps with forensic psychology. Now, forensic psychology is the application of psychology to law and the criminal justice system. So as we mentioned uh, earlier, he wrote on topics like crime prevention, hypnosis, creating tests to determine guilt or innocence. He was interested in eyewitness testimony and argued uh, that eyewitness testimony was flawed. Now we give a lot of uh, credit to Elizabeth Loftus for her research on the misinformation effect, but Hugo Munsterberg was saying this in the early 1900s that we cannot trust people and their eyewitness testimony. So he designed an experiment, which he simulated crimes and asked people to describe what they saw immediately after. What was interesting was immediately after observing uh, a so-called crime, people could not accurately report what they said, what they saw, they disagreed. And he said, well, if you can't remember right after you saw something, how much worse is your eyewitness memory a month later? So he criticized eyewitness testimony. Uh, and then obviously Elizabeth Loftus' work validates this even further. 1908, he wrote a book called On the Witness Stand, which talked about um, factors that influences a trial's outcomes, such as false confessions, uh, improper cross-examinations, uh, the use of physiological um, measures to determine guilt or innocent. So that was his gift to forensic psychology. He also had gifts to psychotherapy. So 1909, as I said, he wrote the book Psychotherapy. He treated uh, patients in his lab. Um, he never charged a fee, so it was all pro bono. And uh, what he felt was that psychological illness was due to some behavior maladjustment, not the unconscious. So those are actually shots fired uh, for psychoanalysis and uh, inspiration to behaviorism, which we'll talk about in the second half of the term. Now he treated patients, uh, how to suppress negative ideas, um, and he used hypnosis. And ultimately uh, he stopped using hypnosis when um, he was threatened with a gun by some woman he was treating. So that also was a public scandal. So his book became one of the leading books in the field of clinical psychology Interesting to note that Whitmer, who was also working in the field of clinical psychology or what was school psychology at that point, he kind of felt that Munsterberg's uh, approach cheapened clinical psychology. And he kind of felt that some of the cures that Munsterberg said he did were actually fake or fictitious. Now, 
I'm going fast because I have an 11, a hard 11 o'clock stop. Uh, he also was a promoter of industrial and organizational psychology. He wrote a book called Psychology in the Market and Efficiency. So these are now similar to the work that Walter Dill Scott is doing. Um, and he felt the best way to have an efficient marketplace was to match people's mental ability with their job. So again, uh, some of the testing that Scott was doing uh, to properly place people in a job, he was saying anecdotally. And he also thought that having people talk together was a bad thing. Um, and it actually reduced productivity, but you shouldn't act actively say, no, don't do it um, because it's psychologically harmful. But one major application of, um, of this is the cubicle model. Putting people in cubicle makes it harder for people to chit chat and talk to one another. And then ultimately he became interested and created the chronoscope, which is measuring time intervals at a hundredth of a second. And that, my friends, is our lecture. So I'm going to stop there and end the video. And then I'm going to share it with the class as a resource if you want it.